this gentleman gained about seven or eight pounds of scale weight, but he put on 12 pounds of lean body mass and lost three pounds of fat mass. Wow. Yeah. So like, and that was in a 12 week period. And like, I think there's so much potential there. I'm, I'm a big fan of, of my muscle connection. In some ways, evidence-based training has hurt competitive bodybuilders in certain aspects because now everybody is following a very black and white blueprint. So I want to kick things off talking about body recomposition. You have a ton of experience here from when you collaborated with Jeff Nippard on the ultimate guide to body recomp, and you even published a paper on it in 2020. From my understanding, you've defined body recomposition as either building muscle mass and losing fat mass simultaneously or gaining muscle mass, gaining more muscle mass than fat mass. That way your body fat percentage is going down. You've also mentioned the common zeitgeist is that people think that it only happens in novice untrained people or overweight people. Mm -hmm. You notice that this happened in a wide spectrum of demographics. Can you talk about the variables that contribute to a successful body recomp in as much detail as possible? Yeah, for sure. For sure. So definitely those, uh, I think those two definitions are important. I think the traditional definition is simply gaining muscle and losing fat at the same time. Um, in the ebook, we kind of simply added, well, Hey, if you're making great progress and you're gaining more, more muscle than fat mass, then your body fat percent will be going down. So that's kind of like a, a different kind of recomp, but not a traditional one. Um, there are so many variables there and, what sparked a lot of interest for me in regards to having a publication around it, ironically, even though this term has been used for like 30 plus years in magazines, um, the term body recomposition was never used in any published literature. So um, I've been in the lab since 2016, 2015, 2016 at the University of Tampa. And some of the first studies that we did um, we weren't expecting recomposition or that wasn't what we were trying to measure. We were looking at like strength and size outcomes for different training variables. And I just noticed like maybe 30 ish percent of the subjects in the study did recomp. And I found that really interesting. And we kept seeing it over and over again. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to see like, well, has this been published over the last 20 years in the literature? And it sure was and stuff like that. So we kind of moved forward with the paper on it, but, um, you were asking what are the main contributing factors there? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So the main contributing factors are obviously going to be the training stimulus and as well as your nutrition. Um, I'm currently in a recomposition phase myself because I was detrained. So even though I am very advanced, I have, you know, 13 ish years of bodybuilding experience, um, becoming a new father. I took a couple steps back in terms of training frequency, training intensity, and everything like that. And uh, I definitely was not tracking nutrition tightly by any means. So um, I feel like I decomped a bit, and now I'm getting back to recomping. So essentially, my training is in a really good spot. I have a good stimulus. I'm progressing in the gym, and uh, I'm consuming enough protein at the end of the day. Recomp can happen whether you're in a caloric deficit at maintenance or sometimes even in a surplus, depending on the individual. Um, so the main contributing factor on the nutritional side, I feel like it's just ensuring you're getting enough protein. Um, but from the training side, it's making sure that you have a progressive stimulus in place. So that can look like a lot of different things for a lot of different people. Okay. And when you say enough protein, I know that you've mentioned that there's flaws in the recommendation of like 20 to 30 grams, uh, per, per kind of serving and that people mm -hmm. can only and that meal frequency or um, isn't that important. Can you maybe talk more about how important protein intake is and what your general recommendations are? Yeah, for sure. So I generally recommend a, an absolute minimum of one gram of protein per pound of lean body mass, not of total body weight. So let's say you have a 200 pound male, that's 20% body fat. Um, they should consume a minimum of 160 grams of protein per day if they're trying to recomp. Um, more could potentially be better, and that's been kind of demonstrated in the literature over time because it is so satiating, it is so thermogenic. Um, it kind of tips the scales in your favor. So let's say you have two people on a 2,000-calorie diet, and one of them is consuming 
200 grams of protein and that other person is consuming 160 grams of protein, even though their caloric intake is the same, the person consuming 200 grams of protein versus 160 grams of protein is going to have a higher caloric expenditure because of the thermic defect of food. So it kind of just tips the scale in your favor for fat loss and recomposition. Um, so that's my absolute minimum was one gram. I generally recommend closer to 1.2 grams to 1.6 grams of protein, depending on your body comp. So the leaner you are, I recommend protein being a bit higher. And then the more body fat you have, you can have a little bit less protein because you have so many uh, energy reserves that your body can tap into for fuel. So you're you're not really risking like being catabolic or, or losing muscle mass. Um, one thing I quickly wanted to touch on when I said the training stimulus can be so different depending on the demographic and the individual. Literally, like it, it depends where the person is starting from, right? So if you take somebody who's been relatively sedentary, um, they can have successful recomposition by literally just cycling and cleaning up their diet. Like they don't need to, you know, resistance train three to five days per week um, because their previous stimulus was essentially zero the cycling stimulus itself will grow some amount of lean body mass or some amount of muscle on their legs while they're losing fat mass. Again, if they're in a deficit and their nutrition's in a good spot. Whereas for someone like myself, if I stop my weightlifting and I just do cycling, I'm not going to expect my legs to grow, but it's all relative to where the individual is starting from, right? Um, people can make great recomposition progress with just doing body weight exercises, depending on where they're starting from. So. Um, your starting point is super, super important. And that's why there are drastic individual differences um, for everybody trying to kind of undergo a recomposition phase. And in your experience, you know, for like an intermediate lifter, let's say with someone who's been lifting three to five years, if they're at the end of their bulk and they're, you know, let's say 18 to 20% body fat, should they be able to recomp effectively uh, at that stage if they have those variables you've talked about in check? Yeah, I think they can. I think they can. Um, basically, as long as you're not at your like genetic potential from the muscle growth side and you have fat to lose, the way I view it is like whether you're in a deficit or in a surplus or whether your primary goal is fat loss or muscle building, your training and your nutrition should always support muscle building regardless. And then your caloric intake is going to primarily dictate whether you're losing fat on a weekly basis, you're staying around the same body weight or if scale weight's going up. Um, but I've just seen it so many times with the clients I work with one-on-one -on -one, as well as individuals in the lab. Like I, I worked with a gentleman uh, last year. He was around 53 years of age. Um, the guy has had resistance training experience for 15 years, but on and off, he's a professional not a competitive bodybuilder, doesn't take this stuff seriously, but he was in the gym three days per week for over a decade, right? Um, we really dialed in his variables and this gentleman gained about seven or eight pounds of scale weight, but he put on 12 pounds of lean body mass and lost three pounds of fat mass. Wow. Yeah. So like, and that was in a 12 week period. And like, sometimes I post this stuff to like my Instagram stories or I post it online and like, you get so many questions and they're like, well, what else is going on here? And I'm like, literally nothing. Like you see the timeline of the scan, like I'm sharing everything I can possibly share. But um, a lot of people are usually leaving stuff on the table. So for that individual in, in uh, particular, I've trained with him in person at the beginning of this phase. And I noticed that his, his rep execution wasn't great. Um, he can really control his negatives much better. Um, he can push closer to like localized muscle failure rather than systemic failure. Um, some people reach failure when they're training by just having like pure grit and pure effort. And like they're using their entire body to complete the repetition. Okay. Um, and that's great for like, that's great that the effort level is that high. Um, but when you can hone in on like just using the target muscles of the exercise and allowing that to be the reason why you fail and you're really cleaning up your repetition execution, uh, a lot of good things can happen from a, a muscle building standpoint. Um, the stimulus is going to be better and the, the overall fatigue is going to be less. So there's a lot of benefits to 
trying to re-standardize and like really perfect your form and try to perform your resistance training exercises the same way you kind of see a professional natural bodybuilder lift. Like the reps look really clean, nice and smooth. The intensity is there. Um, basically everything stays the same except the speed of their concentric right uh throughout the set and and that's something you'll see with like experienced lifters um their rep execution should look pretty pretty solid and it looks way different than an intermediate okay yeah i think that makes sense and then you know not everyone's going to have access to something like a dexa scan so how would you consider like the easiest ways the average person can uh measure if they're going through uh, body recomposition for sure so waist circumference measurements super beneficial um, i don't think you need to do this too frequently depending on where you're at you can do it uh almost like a maximum of bi-weekly so like twice a month is the most i would have someone do it if they're really seeking that feedback that hey things are moving in the right direction i am losing body fat because especially for people that are slightly detrained or very detrained your body weight might not move that much once you get back into resistance training because now you start storing more muscle glycogen um you have more intracellular water so the scale might not go down as quickly as you want it to go um and sometimes like you might know that you're in a calorie deficit but you're just not seeing the scale move the way that you would want it to and that downward direction but if you have another metric like a, a waist circumference measure a uh, waist circumference measurement that's a really good sign that hey i'm either gaining body fat or i'm losing body fat and around the trunk is where most people you know store a lot and then obviously once we start losing body fat we'll, we'll lose at least you know half an inch or an inch after a couple of weeks so that's a that's a good positive feedback sign yeah, I've been measuring waist circumference weekly for years. Actually, okay. I do the scale as well, but it's just been, it's a good way for me to know like when to end my bulks and how, you know, my cuts are going. And, and I just find it as a really good tool. Um, and also to kind of measure it year over year, I can say, okay, mm -hmm. last time I was, you know, 80 centimeters, you know, I was at this weight and I'm at yep. this weight. So I actually find this to be a pretty good tool. That's cool. Have you noticed that like, your waist circumference is uh, at a similar level now, but you're at a higher body weight. So like, that's a good sign for you. Like, hey, I put on muscle and, and I cut my waist at a certain size kind of thing. I have, but I also yeah. have found that any time that I bulk, regardless of how lean I attempt to bulk, my uh, waist circumference goes up pretty rapidly within mm -hmm. like, you know, a five, six month bulk. Yeah. My waist will go up, you know, six, seven centimeters. Yeah. And uh, I think some of it's probably like age. I've been overweight. I've probably poor genetics there. So just the uh, understanding of like, I need to be as moderate as possible during the bulk, but I also just have yeah. to be aware that like, it's just something to keep track of. Yeah, yeah, for sure. That's, that's great that you have that metric. Um, I think progress photos are obviously super beneficial too. Um, taking that in the same lighting, the same setting, all of that can be really, really beneficial. Um, and then the frequency of it just depends on the, the individual. Are there any like smaller rocks or variables that you want to mention? Like, I know there's things like sleep probably and stress management, like outside of kind of new nutrition and that training stimulus that you think people that have that in check, like these are the next two or three that they should be. Yeah. Mindful of? Yeah. So I'll, I'll, uh, give a little bit more detail on nutrition and then maybe dive into some other variables. But, um, we spoke about total protein intake. A lot of people just focus on total protein intake. Um, I don't think that's ideal, right? So let's just say a lot of people say, oh, it doesn't matter if you have two meals per day or five meals per day, you're going to get the same results. I just, I simply disagree with that. Um, a lot of people say that and, and they claim to be evidence-based because that's basically what the literature currently demonstrates. Um, but when you work with individuals one-on-one -on -one for longer periods of time, you see that there is differences there. Um, and then we can talk about why the literature may not be um, representing that well at the moment. That's kind of a different topic. But um, for example, if someone's consuming 160 grams of protein per day, um, 
I think somebody would be way better off having four meals at 40 grams of protein rather than two meals at 80. And again, this might not make a difference, you know, week one or week two, but if you kind of scale this out for eight weeks long, 12 weeks long, 16 weeks long, I think that individual is going to build more muscle mass and, and, or potentially lose more fat depending on what the rest of their calories are like. So I think meal frequency can play a beneficial role. Um, again, I just don't think like the traditional American diet, you can just say it's three meals per day, right? Um, at the very least, I recommend people aim for four. And even if that, that fourth feeding is simply a protein shake or a smoothie or something pretty simple, I think that can be beneficial uh, over the long haul. And hey, at the very least, that might even be an opportunity for you, not just to hit a certain protein threshold, but maybe consume an additional 30 grams of protein per day than you previously were. And there can be benefits to that. So rather than thinking like, let's keep protein equated. It's like, well, what's a, what's the easy way for me to actually increase my protein, um, mm -hmm. for the long haul. So I think that's beneficial. I talk about like pre-workout and post-workout nutrition, how to optimize that. I don't know if you, if you want to dive into that, we can, but I think that can play a role just because pre-workout nutrition is going to impact how you perform in the gym. Post-workouts obviously going to impact how you recover. And then when you zoom out on how that's going to impact your entire week and then your entire, you know, mesocycle and your performance throughout that cycle. Well, if we know that performance is super important to actually progress, mm -hmm. then what can we do to enhance performance for the long haul? Right. Like right now, when you look at the scientific literature, it says it doesn't really matter as long as the person is satiated. Right. As long as they're not hungry going into the gym. Um, they should perform well. And there's a lot of nuance here. Um, the way that somebody feels in their when they're at caloric maintenance or in a caloric surplus. So if, if, if you're bulking, um, you can probably go into the gym fasted and feel good for a 45 to 60 minute workout. Um, whereas if you've been dieting for six weeks, eight weeks, you're not going to feel as good training fasted. Um, so that pre-workout meal is really going to sustain your performance. So there's so much individual context there. And, um, when we're trying to enhance performance and enhance recovery, those variables can play a pretty big role. And then again, when you kind of scale that to outcomes, it's like, all right, this is impacting how much muscle this person's put on and how much fat they lost. So those things can be super important. Do you have any guidance for, uh, pre-workout, uh, nutrition? Yeah, for sure. Um, again, super like general guidelines, but I like most people consuming around one gram of carbohydrate per kilogram of body weight. So let's say the person weighs 70 kilos, they'll have approximately 70 grams of carbs. Um, and I'd like to have some sort of split between starchy carbohydrate and, and a little bit of fruit, right? So I like having a, like a, a, glyc a, a glucose rich source, like a starchy source that's going to break down into glucose. And I also like having a fruit source that's going to provide a little bit of fructose because those carbohydrates have different transporters. And if you have both of them present, you can actually utilize them more efficiently because of the digestive process and because of the transport proteins. Um, so for example, if someone's going to have 65 grams of carbs in their pre-workout meal, I might have them have 40 grams from a starchy source and then like 25 grams from fruit. Um, and then their protein is going to be relatively uh, evenly distributed throughout the, throughout the day. So if they're having approximately 40 grams per meal, they'll just have that same 40 grams in that pre-workout meal. And then the amount of fat that they consume in their pre-workout meal is going to depend on how far away is that, that training session. So hmm. if they're training, you know, 60 minutes from now, it's going to be a relatively low fat meal because I don't want to really slow down the digestive process too much. If they're training like two and a half hours from now, I would like to increase the fat. So I'm slowing down the digestive process. And when they get to the gym, they're not feeling empty, right? Um, so those are some things that you can take into consideration. I might even had, have more fiber uh, in that pre-workout meal if they're training a couple hours from, from that meal. Um, if somebody's training like 30 minutes from now, it's going to be super simple rather than trying to force 60 grams of carbs in. Um, I'm probably going to suggest just like a, a banana and a little bit of whey protein, 
So something that, okay. that's going to digest really quickly. Uh, it's not going to cause any, you know, GI distress while they're in the gym and they should feel fine like 30 to 40 minutes from then. Um, so it's all context dependent, right? It's all context dependent. Um, and then post-workout is, is kind of similar, um, but rather than like low glycemic, medium glycemic carbs, I generally recommend higher glycemic carbs, things that will digest kind of quick. Um, but there's so much context there too. Um, if this is like, if somebody trains at 6 p.m. and their post-workout meal is the final meal of the night, it's going to be more whole food based things that are going to take a bit longer to digest. I'm definitely going to have them do like a whole food protein rather than just a shake. But if somebody's maybe training first thing in the morning or training midday, and they're going to have multiple meals later on, I'll probably recommend something easy to digest like cream of rice or even a cereal with some protein or a little bit of fruit or whatever it may be. So food sources, the quantities, all of that's going to kind of depend on uh, their daily schedule and their structure. But that's how you optimize things for the long haul, right? It's like you take all these things into consideration and um, you try to make sure that it's as, as uh, logical as it can be. Yeah. And I appreciate you giving general guidelines uh, while I understand the level of nuance here, because a lot of this stuff is more like there's an art to it and there isn't every individual is a little bit different. I'm sure you know that as a coach, right? It's like you're kind of working with that person with, their body, their mentality. So um, there's obviously a lot of nuance in all of these topics, but I think some general guidelines can be helpful for, to the people listening. For sure, for sure. And like personal preference is huge too, right? So if something is less optimal, but way more sustainable for an individual, I'm still going to recommend they execute that rather than something that's more optimal on paper that they simply don't enjoy. So and that, like that principle can be applied to nutrition, to training, to so many things. Um, but it's super important to treat the individual like an individual and like troubleshoot what's going to be best for them to get yeah. the results. Yeah, my uh, post-workout is a shake because as I go to the, the locker room, the guy makes eye contact and he makes the shake and then I drink it on oh, my uh, drive home. So just the nice. level of convenience there is like... I know it's it's it might not be perfect, but I know it's good. And oh, that's great. And it's just it's super convenient, right? Like by the time I'm done the drive home, I've had that, and then I can eat an hour yeah. or two later again. That's perfect. That's perfect. And I'm sure what they're throwing in other things besides the protein, like frozen banana or it's, oats it's, or something. Yeah, it's mostly like yeah. berries and banana and cool. and yeah, whey protein. So yeah, yeah. that works, man. Awesome. Uh, so now I want to throw out a couple of topics and tell me if you think it's underrated, overrated, or fairly rated. Okay. Um, and we kind of talked about this earlier. So I'm, I'm curious, mind muscle connection. Depends on the camp you're talking to, right? So some people will overrate it. Some people will underrate it. Well, let's, I let's think say I, the evidence-based fitness community specifically. I think or, under underrated. Underrated. Why? Um, I don't think they appreciate the the art of it, the the skill component there, and how it can translate to potential progress over the long haul. Um, I do have a I have a competitive bodybuilding background, so it is a little like I think of these things a little bit differently. But I'll, I'll provide some examples. So um, I just had a client come into town from Alaska. She came into Tampa to train with me last week, and um, she's an intermediate, right? So she has a, a long way to progress, but when we were going through exercises, I was trying to tell her, okay, we're not just thinking about moving the load from point A to point B, but like, I want you to feel the muscle lengthen and shorten during your eccentric and your concentric. And I want you to focus on that more so than moving the weight, right? So I'm going to take the lying hamstring curl as an example. So like when we were doing lying hamstring curls, I was like, rather than moving this apparatus, you know, your heels closer to your butt. I want you to think about flexing your hamstring and because you're flexing your hamstring, that external apparatus is moving from here to here because mm -hmm. your hamstring is shortening. And then while you're doing your negative, I want you to think about your hamstring lengthening over time and then it's returning to its starting point. Um, when you perform exercises with that intent, you feel such a, it feels quite different. and. Some of that can't be measured. Um, some of it can. Some of it can be measured with EMG, but a lot of people also hate on 
how EMG can be applied and what you can take away from that. Um, but if you are intentionally contracting something and you are measuring it with an EMG, you are going to see greater amplitudes. Um, we just don't necessarily know how that translates to like more muscle growth over time. So I think it depends on your goal. Some te- I don't want to get too off topic, but some te- some people take a very like movement centric approach to their training. And then some people take more of a muscle centric approach. And what I mean by that is mm-hmm. like, some people are going to say, I want you to press. I want you to pull. I want you to hinge. I want you to lunge. Right. And they, they're going to keep it very, very functional and very movement based. Whereas a bodybuilder, when they're pressing, they're going to really be focused on their, their pecs and their delts and their triceps rather than just pressing. Um, when they're hinging, they're really thinking about their hamstrings and glutes rather than just this hinge movement pattern. Right. Um, I think there's a lot there with the my muscle connection. Um, and again, sorry to, to bring it back for me. I kind of translate it to posing. So like if I'm doing a lying hamstring curl, I'm like, okay, how is this exercise helping my rear double bicep bodybuilding pose, right? Cause I'm contracting my hamstrings. My hips are extended forward. My glutes are extended. I'm, I'm contracting this entire posterior train. How is this movement helping me hit that pose? So I take, a slightly different approach and I'm using exercises as tools to help me with my bodybuilding poses rather than just like I'm doing this movement to do the movement. Um, but I think there's a lot there for my muscle connection. I think if people want to save their joints, get a really good stimulus with less weight, um, and probably create a better stimulus with less fatigue and reduce the risk of injury, they should focus more on this mind muscle connection. I think it'll keep them safer over time. And, uh, I think they'll get a great, great training stimulus while potentially lifting lower loads initially at first, like you're going to have to drop your load initially, and then you'll scale back up. But I think there's so much potential there. I'm, I'm a big fan of of my muscle connection. Yeah. I feel like it also helps, uh, in terms of exercise selection, like, you know, you test out some different exercises and you figure out which one you can get a really good mind muscle connection with, especially sometimes with smaller muscles. Like I know for me, for like rear delts, for example, like I'm like, okay, this specific movement, like it might be like cables behind the back. Like I'm really feeling it in my rear delt. So just kind of stick with that and keep progressing on it. For sure. For sure. So like if you're doing any sort of like horizontal pull towards your sternum and your elbows are flared to a relative degree, you're going to train your rear delts. Like they're going to assist with the movement. But if you're doing like a, a cross body cable fly and you're like isolating your, your rear delt more, you're probably going to feel it more. And if you're trying to teach somebody how to engage X, Y, Z muscle, it's great to start with some isolation movements. And then they can think about how does that feel when they're performing compound movements? I think it's a great approach. Um, I know a lot of people like to focus on the compounds because they think they get a a better bang for their buck um, in terms of like efficiency. And there's, there's absolute truth to that, but there's still value in teaching people isolation movements, even as beginners, just so they learn what these muscles contracting feels like, and then they can translate that over to their, their compounds. But, but like you said, um, it can improve with your exercise selection. So let's just take, Let's say we have a female that's really trying to improve their glutes. Um, let's say they're doing a a light press machine or a, a particular hack squat machine. And the next day their quads are really sore, but their glutes aren't sore at all. And even while they were doing it, they didn't feel it in their glutes. Um, that's probably not going to be the best glute builder, even though it's a compound uh, squat pattern movement, right? Whereas maybe they have a, a V squat machine or a different machine that while they're performing, they're like, oh, I feel this a lot more in my glutes. I got a better stretch here. And then the next day their glutes are sore. That's probably going to be a better movement for them um, for that particular goal, right? So definitely can be a good tool to uh, improve your own exercise selection. Awesome. I got one more topic here. Unilateral exercises. Uh, Oh, overrated, underrated? Yeah. Yeah. In the bodybuilding world, probably slightly underrated. Um, and again, it just depends like what camps you're in, right? In the functional world, they're probably like really favored. So maybe overrated. Um, I think 
a lot of people obviously do a decent amount of unilateral work with their upper body, I feel like, because um, they're just working with dumbbells and then maybe they're doing like single arm pull downs every once in a while or something like that. I think maybe it's neglected a little bit, a little bit more for the lower body. So some people avoid the really hard things like Bulgarian split squats. Those suck. Um, <laughs> a lot of people uh, maybe avoid like walking lunges or reverse step lunges and stuff. So I think it's important to do. Um, I also recommend people if they are doing unilateral work to start with their weak side first, allow that to determine the appropriate load and the appropriate like rep target, and then just match it on their strong side until their uh, weak side catches up essentially, right? So um, there is going to be a pretty large discrepancy and that discrepancy is going to be even larger for beginners or intermediates. Um, so yeah, there's going to be one side that's way stronger just because of like whatever you use more during your activities of daily living. Um, so it's important to do that. Start with the weak side first and progress over, progress over time. And would you, if you had those imbalances, would you do the same amount of reps? Um, or would it be more, uh, from a reps and reserve standpoint? I personally do it the same amount of reps. So okay. I'll, I'll give an example. Like um, when I do single arm lat pull downs, I always start on my right side because my left side is stronger. So let's say I have three plates on the machine. I might get 10 reps on my right side at an RIR of zero. And then on my left side, I get 10 reps, but I definitely had two reps in the tank. But I just I just leave it there. Okay. Um, I just allow my left side to do a little bit, a little bit less work or the same amount of work, uh, from a quantity standpoint, but less work from a stimulus or intensity standpoint. And I just leave it be until that other side kind of catches up. Cool. Yeah. That's debatable though. Right. There's like different ways you can approach it. I just feel like if I took the strong side to that same level of intensity, it's going to continue to grow and to continue For to sure. progress. Like, when is that other side going to catch up? So, yeah, that's why I do it the way I do it. Awesome. All right. Now I'm going to throw out some quotes that you've said in the past. Give me your first take on oh, it. Oh, boy. Okay. All right. Uh, the thing I love most about bodybuilding has nothing to do with the body itself. It's a discipline of self-betterment and a process filled with checks and balances, self-governing, auditing your thoughts, actions, and thus outcomes realized. Yeah, I, I still feel the same way. Um, that is where, like, that is where the, I don't want to say long-term benefits come from, but, like, if you get into it for simply improving yourself over time, practicing discipline over time, staying committed to something over time, there's so much benefit there that... <laughs> surpasses the physical uh, muscle that you've built the the fitness and health benefits that come with that that's all great like obviously i i'm an advocate for that but i think people who aren't too familiar with bodybuilding uh think it is extremely vain and the people doing it care way too much about their body or they just want to show off their physique um, there are people in the industry that are like that for sure. But so many people um, don't want to show their physique at all unless it's competition day. Um, they like wearing hoodies and staying covered up and whatever it may be. Um, but they like practicing the discipline of, hey, I'm going to train five days per week. I'm going to eat a certain way. The thing, let me expand on this. So there is so much stuff going on in our lives that we can't control, right? things with family members, things with work situations. Um, there's so many external stressors that we need to be okay with like surrendering to because we don't directly influence it. Right. But like what we put in our mouth and what we do with our physical body, like we can make a commitment there. So, you know, I think there's, that's empowering in itself is I'm going to control what I can control and things outside of my life that I can't directly control. I'm going to be okay with things with the chips falling as they may. And like, there's going to be obstacles that pop up out of nowhere. 
Um, there's going to be challenges throughout different time periods in our life. That's always going to happen, but you can use the discipline of bodybuilding as like your anchor and something that empowers you to have a sense of control and have actual control over certain variables. That's what yeah. I love about it. Yeah, I think what I've really enjoyed interviewing people who've been doing this, you know, for over a decade is you can tell that there's just a certain level of like wisdom that comes from doing it at a high level because of all the things you just met, mentioned, like that level of control, that level of discipline that can be applied to different parts of your life. And I feel like that's why I enjoy, you know, just recreational body lifting, bodybuilding as well is I've kind of gained that wisdom kind of from my experience in kind of the business and tech world. But in that world, you can do everything right and still not be successful. Mm. And I think that is, it can be scary. Um, yeah. But what's cool about bodybuilding is that level of control for me. It's like, if I do the right things, I'm going to see results. Yeah. I understand it's going to be diminishing results, but I'm going to see those results. And to me, that's pretty empowering. Super empowering, super empowering. And that's one reason I fell in love with it because I used to, um, I used to love basketball with a passion when I was way younger. So it was a, a team sport, right? And I was somebody who played six to eight hours a day, slept with my basketball, like had it with me everywhere I went. And my teammates in high school, like didn't take it seriously to the same degree. Right. So, um, I hated that I can put all this effort, all off season, all season, my whole, like for years and years. And like, I still couldn't control the outcome of, of the game necessarily. Yeah. Right. There's, there's four other people on the court with me, um, lots of stuff going on. So I found bodybuilding from a competitive aspect at 19 and, I really, I don't have great genetic potential for this sport on a competitive standpoint. Um, at 19, I, I was 140 pounds on stage, super skinny. I got, you know, relatively lean, but like nothing impressive. But the thing I loved about it was I controlled my diet. I controlled my chain, my training, and it changed my physique. I was able to kind of predict the outcome pretty well. And because I had like on stage success at a young age, I think it kind of lit a fire under my butt to like keep this trajectory going and just continue to explore what I can do with it. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's super empowering. And it's it's funny that you mentioned the business thing because I, I, you know, work with some gen pop people and some of them are, you know, business executives and this and that. I'm like, you know, in your business, you pay very specific attention to a lot of metrics and certain numbers but you're giving me a lot of pushback on like tracking your food. And I'm like, listen, you can, you know, if we shoot at the dark and, and we're trying to throw something with our, with blindfolds on, like you might hit the target, but you're way better off. If like the blindfolds are off, we're not in the dark and you're actually measuring um, what metrics you're trying to manipulate. Right. So yeah, it's, it's funny that some people are so resistant to that in certain aspects of their life but they understand how important it is in others um but yeah and and then you can just apply this discipline to other things so maybe for some people it's like for you it started on the business front where it's like you were maybe very structured and 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 you understood the value of controlling certain inputs exactly um but you felt like you're still playing like you're still gambling like you couldn't really control the outcome that you wanted um, whereas with some people if they start with this nutrition and training stuff they should be able to implement it to other parts of their lives, but they struggle to do that too. So it's like a two-way street. Um, but hopefully you can use disciplines to to help you as, as a whole, like holistically, right? Um, yeah. I think what's interesting with the business people, I just thought of this. It's like the first thing you think is like revenue minus expenses equals profit. That's the same thing as like, Calories in. Calories in minus calories out equals weight loss, profit, yeah. or however you want to like. Like it's the same equation. So you know that's the fundamental most important equation in business. Like if there's no profit, you're out of business. Everything else are like the small rocks. So you should track your calories if you're trying to lose fat because it's it's the it's the big one. Absolutely. Absolutely. It it really is that simple. And uh Sometimes people hear that and it clicks and they're like, oh, I, I now I now see the importance of it. 
sometimes people have heard misinformation or focused on the wrong things for 15 to 30 years that when they hear that, it almost seems too simple to be true, to be valid. And it's like, there's no way it's, it's, it's that simple. It, it is. You know? I have a friend who, you know, once a year he stops eating carbs and he loses a little weight and then he totally falls back off. And then the next year he chats with me and I tell him to count his calories and then he goes back to his no carb thing and yeah. the cycle repeats. Yeah, it's tough, man. It's tough. All right. Next one here. The last 20 years of exercise science research has no made no practical difference to the muscular development of natural bodybuilders competing on stage. Nutritional sciences have not moved the needle much either. Natural bodybuilders do get leaner today, primarily due to longer contest prep and dieting phases, not because of novel dietary or exercise interventions. Facts. Facts. Nothing, nothing else for me to say. No, I'm yep. kidding. Um, no, I really do feel that way. So that's one. I, I have some certain frustrations with the evidence-based fitness community um, in certain ways and even certain researchers in the field. Oh, man, it's there's a lot of layers. There's a lot of layers to it. But what I'm saying in that message is if you look at world champions, natural bodybuilding world champions in 1995, 2005, 2015, um, they're all carrying the same amount of muscle mass back then as they are now. It's just the standard for conditioning is higher now. Mm -hmm. And the only reason, the only reason we get leaner today is because the standard has been raised that you, you must to. reach this level of conditioning. And the only reason we get there is because we now diet for 20 to 28 weeks rather than eight to 16 weeks. Yeah. So we've extended the duration of the diet and the deficit, but the practices are the same. They were basically doing the same exact stuff 20 plus years ago. Um, whether it was tracked paper and pen in a notepad or what now we're using, you know, food tracking log apps on our phone. It's the same crap. They were eating four to six meals per day, eating a ton of protein, same stuff. It was the same stuff. Um, I actually think in some ways, evidence-based training has hurt competitive bodybuilders in certain aspects because now everybody is following a very, black and white blueprint in my opinion of you either do an upper lower split you do a push pull leg split or you do a full body split whatever it is you do these splits that are utilized in the literature in the research rather than doing a split that like best suits your needs your weak points that maybe takes away the amount of volume you're doing on your strengths i just feel like everyone trains the same way now and they say it's the right way to train because boom, it has the stamp of being evidence-based. And I'm like, all right, but what about like you as an individual? Like, yeah. what do you want to do? What are you trying to build? You know, so I have a lot of just general frustrations. And in some ways, I feel like we actually have taken steps back. Um, I don't know how long have you said you got into bodybuilding around 2013, 2016? I'd say 2016. Uh, okay. Yeah. So there was a phase where pretty high level bodybuilders, pro bodybuilders were also competing in powerlifting and that bled into the lower level bodybuilders and amateurs. They just kind of look at the pros. Okay. What are the pros doing? I want to do the same thing. So a lot of people started power building and I personally think that negatively impacted the physiques that we saw on bodybuilding mm -hmm. stages for a little while. Um, People were so focused on barbell squats, barbell bench, and deadlifting that their physiques weren't fully developed from a bodybuilding standpoint. So like shoulders and arms were heavily neglected. Um, a lot of direct back work was heavily neglected. Yeah, I, I think some of these trends that we have seen over the last 15 years in the evidence-based space there's they catch on so much and they influence so many people. Some of them have potentially neg negative. Yeah. I think, I think, I think sometimes it's actually had negative, uh, 
negative influences on yeah competitive outcomes and how people look on stage and stuff. I, I think where it's strange, um, and we can we can talk basketball here for a second, is like when people are saying this would make the top athlete better. It would be like telling Steph Curry that he should shoot more like Clay Thompson because he has a cleaner form, and that's ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. I totally agree. And that's the thing. It's like when you're when you're looking at elite natural bodybuilders, world class bodybuilders. It almost doesn't matter what their split looks like, right? As long as they're getting a sufficient weekly volume for those muscle groups, they're going to look great regardless, right? Um, like I've ha I've had the opportunity. This is a little random, but like years back, um, I had the opportunity to work with somebody who was a world champion before I started working with him. And me as a coach, I've never taken any credit for this man's success. Like even while we were working together, I would kind of like constantly put out there like this man was this man before me and this man will still be this man without my coaching guidance. Right. Like he's already had success in these accolades. Whereas like you see other coaches they'll get a world champion that was a world champion before them and they continue to have stage success. And like, they want to take credit for like their training and their nutrition approach that like this person looks the way they do. It's like, bro, they looked amazing 12 months ago before they ever knew you and they were winning shows before they ever knew you and they will continue to look good like with or without you. Right. It's like, I don't know, man. Um, that's a little bit, that's a little bit off topic, but I don't it's, think it's uh, off topic. I think it's on topic. Yeah, yeah, it's on topic. <laughs> All right. I hope it's. I hope I'm not going into tangents, but yeah, people, you know, want to say that their approach is superior. Their approach is optimal. Their approach is evidence based. Um, but I don't know. There's a lot of we, a lot of context we, there. We talked about like wisdom and nuance before. I think as you get wiser in life, you realize that there's no best approach. And it's just the approach that works for this person in this situation at this time. And, yeah. and that's all. And, and people don't like that. Um, so um, when Berto introduced us, he's like, Chris is a very interesting thinker. And I think when I went into, I started researching you, I realized that. And you had one quote here from Einstein, and I think it really hit home. It was, everything should be made as simple as possible, not simpler. And I feel like that seems to be your approach that maybe people are trying to make things too simple. Yeah, I appreciate that. I appreciate that very much. And I, I respect Berto so much, um, not just as a bodybuilder, but as a thinker, because he's he likes to take individual approaches. He doesn't overvalue the quote unquote research literature, scientific literature. And I think that is like you were talking about undervalued or overvalued or overhyped or underhyped or whatever i think the the scientific literature as a whole is overhyped and misunderstood and um not utilized properly and a large part of that is partially due to the people in the field who are communicating what these findings are and how they should be utilized um but yeah no berto's Berto's an OG man. Um, I think the first time I met him was 2017, I believe, at the Muscle Mayhem. I was competing, and he was like three months out at the time. And then we've, I got to see him a bunch of times over the years. So we keep in touch, and uh, it's always good to see him at the the big competitions, which is cool. Yeah, and he's a new dad too. Yeah, yeah, he's part of the club now, man. So um, I know he was thinking to potentially compete this year, and I think he still might, but. He also might put it on the back burner till next year, um, which I totally understand. Totally awesome. get that. Awesome. I'm going to go in a more fun direction here, a little less deep here. Cool. Uh, so I think one of your uh, strongest body parts is your arms. So what is your Mount Rushmore, your four favorite exercises for biceps and triceps? Cool. Awesome question. And this actually goes back to what you were just talking about, about like Steph Curry and Clay Thompson and that. Yeah. Um, I don't train arms that much anymore at all. I used to blast them when I was younger. Yeah, I used to, I blast them hard when I was way younger. Um, I have good bicep shape all because of my father. 
Like my dad, <laughs> my dad has the peak. Like he's always had like a nice bicep peak. Um, so I have like a good, ins really low insertion uh, on my forearm, my biceps. So I have cool, cool peak there. Triceps were actually always a weak point of mine until years later. And uh, I'll just share a quick tricep tip. So when I was younger, I always had really good mind muscle connection with my bicep really bad my muscle connection with my tricep and uh the biggest thing that made a difference with my tricep training was picking movements where my shoulder joint my glenohumeral joint my upper arm my humerus was stabilized against an external apparatus um, so like if i was doing dumbbell skull crushers or easy bar skull crushers i didn't feel my triceps too much because my gh joint was moving a little mm -hmm. bit throughout the movement if i do that and i make sure that my gh joint doesn't move at all and the only thing that's moving is my elbow i get a much better tricep connection um and then i was utilizing machines like the thing that's the opposite of the preacher curl machine yeah because you got some I stability right? yeah you have the external stability that helped me like feel my tricep a lot whereas when i was doing like rope push downs where i was getting like movement at my mm. upper arm and my elbow at the same time i just never felt it well um, so now when I do triceps, I just make sure that my upper arm is not moving at all and I'm just moving my elbow joint. So nice. I, I pick like a fixed position. So I can still do like kickbacks with my shoulder joint extended to get the long head fully shortened. But like while I'm doing it, I want to make sure that that upper arm isn't moving as I'm doing the kickback. It's just the elbow, right? So that made a huge difference on my tricep. Um, but yeah, my favorite movements, really simple. Um, Incline dumbbell curl, uh, standing cable curl, and any sort of preacher curl would be bicep. Mm -hmm. And then, so again, you're going like through extension, neutral, and then shortened ish. Mm -hmm. And then for tricep, um, my gym has an amazing, I think it's hammer strength machine where I'm like slightly above 90 and I yeah. have the external support and it's single arm. So it's like a single arm tricep extension machine that kind of mimics a skull crusher slash overhead movement. You're sitting Absolutely. for that one? Is it I'm sitting? Seated. You're seated. Yeah. Okay. So I like I like that one. I like the uh tricep preacher machine thing push down. Okay. And then uh any other sort of push down, you know, cable push down thingy. Awesome. I'll get the job done. Yeah. All right. So you've mentioned your excitement around the future of exercise equipment, and I've seen you mm. using the tonal on Instagram. So I yeah. guess I'm curious what's gone better and worse than expected with it. And then what are you hoping for in the next, you know, 10 years regarding exercise equipment? Yeah. Uh, cool question. So I just got this tonal back in mid April, but unfortunately, I traveled like crazy right when i got it so i was gone for 47 days out of 90 days um so i didn't get to use it much until like recently anyway um i'm really enjoying it i think a lot of the features that you get with like ai based technology is kind of infinite um and it seems like it can be a really great tool for people to get a high effective training stimulus in a short period of time so the reason like i'll just quickly talk about some things i like about it um there's so many features on there so there's a there's a mode called spotter so like let's just say you're doing bicep curls and you have it on 20 pounds right um it's measuring your power output and like the velocity of your concentrics so as you fatigue and as that slows down Obviously, the machine knows that. So spotter mode, if I was curling 20 pounds, if I'm getting stuck, it'll go from 20 pounds to 17 pounds and then 17 and then I'm still getting stuck. Yeah. And then I'm still getting stuck. So then it goes from 17 pounds to 13 pounds to 12 pounds just so I can finish the rep off. Like, I think that's just like that's super, amazing. Super cool. yeah, yeah, just super cool. Um, you can do eccentric overloads on everything. So that's like. You can concentrically curl 25 pounds and then eccentrically do 32 pounds or kind of whatever you want it to be within reason. Um, so I like the eccentric overload thing. And then they also have something called smart flex, 
And that feels really cool on like lateral raise variation. So let's say you want it to be 14 pounds at the very top. It'll be 15 pounds here, 16 pounds here, and 17 pounds here in that more stretched position. So it's like a reverse chain option. That feels cool on laterals. It feels cool on some pulling exercises, whether it's rows or pull down. So lots of lots of uh, potential there. What I'm thinking to do, so I might contest prep in 2025, and I think it'll be really cool if two out of my three training sessions per week for my upper body are done on the machine, and then just one day of the week I go to the gym. Wow. Um, so we'll see. Um, yeah, I think there's a lot of potential there. I'm sorry. What was the other part of the question? Like, Oh, it's just more like what, what are you hoping to see in the future? Yeah. Um, well, the th- I think that's really great because it makes training super accessible. You can have this in your home. You can have it in a garage. And like genuinely, like my wife can get an amazing workout in like 15 to 20 minutes, right? Like a pretty good workout. Um, So I think it's going to be really time efficient. Um, For other exercise equipment, I think I like companies like Prime that are making really cool equipment that have different where you can load the resistance profile in a different way. Right. So you can overload a shortened position or overload a lengthened position. Um, but they've been around for a while and they've had that kind of equipment for a little while, but we'll see. We'll see. Um, the people at tonal are super smart. They have a great sports science team and, um, they're working on really cool things. So we'll see how that all kind of pans out. Cool. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw some pictures on the screen here. Uh, oh, depending boy. on who the person is, tell me uh, either something you learned from them or if you have a fun story. This is a cool podcast. I haven't done this before. Let's awesome, do it. man. Appreciate it. Uh, oh, yeah. First one is uh, Dr. D'Souza. That's my man right there. So that's my ment- my research mentor, um, good friend of mine. He uh, He plays like that that older leader role um in our obviously in our lab at the university but he's also played that for me for a good period of time so when i moved here when i moved to tampa florida in 2015 i was 25 years old um and my parents still lived in new york so i had no family around Mm -hmm. and like him and i became like family so i kind of viewed him as like not only like my research mentor but i felt like he was like an older uncle kind of figure, mm. you know. Um he has two kids, he has a beautiful wife, so like I feel like I was able to observe what he has going on in his life and learn from him just through observation too, not even like direct communication and guidance, but um super super great guy and you know, what yeah, one of my mentors uh in my life and in the research world, so super cool. And like it's pretty crazy too because when I came to the University of Tampa There was someone else working at that lab and he left my first day of uh, my first day of grad school. So if that timing didn't happen, I probably wouldn't have had the opportunity to work as closely with a do. So it was like very serpendipitous and like everything worked out for the better. So, yeah, Um, he 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 calls me. We're we're each other's partner in crime. So, yeah. Things are going well. All right. Next one, uh, Kai oh, Green. <laughs> love it. Love it. Um, one of my biggest influences um, from the bodybuilding perspective, and people might think like that's crazy because he's on the enhanced IFBB side. And like my goal was never to be an IFBB pro and, and ever reach Kai's level. But uh, I've just consumed so much of his content, his old, old content when I first started that I learned so much through his train of thought. So like earlier, I mentioned the lying hamstring curl and how is that going to affect my rear double bicep? Mm. Like I, I have that thought process because of him, because I would hear him say like, when I'm doing seated calf raises, this is my side chest from the ground up. So I learned so much from Kai, um, just watching all of those old videos. And then when I was younger, I lived in Long Island. That's where I was born and raised. I used to go to Bev Francis Powerhouse Gym. So I used to see Kai maybe four-ish times a year. Nice. Um, And I remember he gave me like 30 minutes of his like undivided attention one day in the locker room. 
And uh, this probably was 2013-ish, if I had to guess. And, uh, yeah, that just meant a lot to me. Um, I, I have so much love for Kai. Big inspiration. Uh, awesome, obviously awesome, awesome bodybuilder. And, uh, yeah, I, I hope to, like, reconnect with him soon. We used to DM a little bit back and forth. I haven't, like, reached out in a while. I might have to do that now just to see what's going on. All right, next one here. The the AI. We were talking about AI, but this is the wow. real AI. Wow. <laughs> this is epic. Um, <laughs> did you pull this up on Instagram somehow? I, d- I did. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, I kind of remember posting about this at some point. Um, AI. Um, my biggest inspiration when I was, like, way younger, right, as a kid. Um, I don't know. What can I say? Just, like favorite basketball player for me at that time um it's funny i when i was younger i tried emulating my game after him and then i i do want to share this because in literally like sixth ish grade i was at a summer camp and the varsity head coach for my district um told me i should pass a lot more and you know how i said i would play like six to eight hours a day and none of my teammates would yeah So at the time, like I had the mindset of like, if I shoot, there is a much higher likelihood that we're going to score than if I give it to a teammate that isn't that good. That's how I was like when I was younger. Sounds like Kobe. (laughs) (laughs) But that one coach saying that to me at that age, like really like messed me up mentally, like negatively impacted my mindset. And then I became a very pass first guard. Um even though I probably shouldn't have been. So then like, rather than emulating my game after like AI, I started being more of like a Steve Nash, Jason Kidd kind of. Jason, Jason of Kidd's one of my all time favorite basketball players. Yeah. Yeah. I Love mean, Jason respect, Kidd. respectfully. So, but yeah, AI was the man. Um, legend, absolute legend. Yeah. I have a funny story. I used to work at a sports store, like in high school and I, I saved up to buy like a pair of like, Reebok Iversons and I kept them oh, super yeah. clean for years and uh yeah it was it was it was legendary they're the ones that were they had the, the zip up over the laces so you couldn't see the laces yeah 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 that's what he's wearing in there but those are the white and black ones yeah. but I think that has the zip up down the middle it has yeah. a zip up yeah. all right let's move on here how about uh you and Jeff Nippert here Jeff, man, good friend, like throwback. That's a throwback right there. Um, I haven't seen Jeff in forever, Um, but it's cool. We connected before Instagram days, man. We connected, I think, in like 2013 on Facebook, right? And I was seeing what he was doing in the power building world, powerlifting world, the bodybuilding world. Um, And I'm pretty sure he was going to school to be a, a dentist at the time. And again, we just, we connected through Facebook. And uh, we kept in touch via Instagram and we connected a few times in person, obviously here at Powerhouse Gym. I think I was in, I was still in grad school at this time or I just graduated grad school. Um, we got in a workout and then, yeah, years later, you know, we obviously did the ultimate guide to body recomposition together. That was super cool. And uh, I haven't seen him since Muscle Mayhem 2019. So it's been a little while. It's been a little while, but. He's crushing the game. I'm glad to see him doing great. And uh, yeah, it's awesome to see his influence on bodybuilding and like, you know, evidence-based training. So it's been great. All right. One more here. Ah, man, the homie, the big homie, Matt. Um, Yeah, man. So Matt and I chat every single day at this point. Um, We're in a group chat with uh, Sam Okanola as well. So pretty cool so like you pulling up this photo i can kind of explain like this was maybe 2015 arnold if i had to guess maybe 2014 2015 something like that um but i was following matt's journey since probably 2012 definitely 2013 and uh we didn't really chat much at all until 2017 so like here in this photo he doesn't really know who i am maybe he's commented on like a random Instagram post of mine or something, but uh, we're not in constant communication at all back then. Um, We started communicating a lot more in 2017 when one of my clients was also his friend and training partner and they were training.
been a lot more since, you know, 2017, 2018 days. And now we chat every day. So he's a father. He's about to be a father of four. I don't know how he does it. And uh, we talk about just like life shit all the time. Dad life, business stuff, um, coaching, clients. And yeah, great, great guy. I, I don't know how he does it with about to be four kids on the way. But he just uh, turned pro, uh, crushed it at an NPC show. So it's super cool, man. But that's it's stuff like that. It's these weird full circle moments where it's like, I used to look up to Kai Green so much. And then I got to a point where I was able to have some really good conversations with him. And I kind of like never expected that. And then same thing with Matt. I used to watch his YouTube videos in 2012, 2013, all the time. I'd even show my girlfriend at the time, who's now my wife, like, look at these natural bodybuilders, like look at what they're doing. I was super inspired by them. And, you know, now we chat on a daily basis. So it's cool to see these full circle things come up. For awesome, sure. Man. Awesome. Yeah. Well, dude, thanks so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Where can everyone Thank find you? Thank you, Varun. Yeah, man. Um, this was a really cool podcast. I wasn't expecting the the random questions, the quotes, the photos. So I, I appreciate you uh, giving me the opportunity to come here and uh, almost forcing me to reflect and reminisce on some stuff. So <laughs> that, was, that was super cool, man. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, people can find me at um on social media i I use instagram here and there my handle is just at christopher.barricat my full name um you guys can find me at schoolofgains.com gains is spelled with a z um it's just a little more anabolic that way and um if you have any questions feel free to reach out you can uh, shoot me a dm on instagram you can reach out through the website and i'll get the email and then email you guys back so yeah it was a pleasure to chat with you varun I, i wish you all the best and uh I look forward to seeing what's in the future for you as well. All right, man. Take care. Yeah, thank you.